Hi there. Welcome to the second episode of our Interview with the Experts series. In this episode, Dr. Will Brooks will be returning to us as he has kindly offered to give us a closer look at his vast collection of firefighting artifacts. If you haven't seen our first video about Will, I highly recommend that you go check it out, since Will shares his personal story and his involvement as a co-founder of the Canadian Fallen Firefighters Foundation. The link to that video can be found in the video description or in the info card up above. Once again, I would like to profoundly thank Will for volunteering his time to share his collection with us. So, Will, to kick things off, what is your favorite item in your collection? I mean, there's so many to choose from. It's really hard to pinpoint one and say this is sort of the keystone part of the collection, but one that I almost always think about a lot is a helmet that's in one of the showcases over there, the helmet that says number three on it. And that helmet was given to me by my sister, who actually found that in the attic of a home that she bought. And I liked it because it was very much like the helmets I saw as a kid when I was uh, haunting firehouses in the area that I lived in. And the helmet right next to it, which says number four on it, is really an older helmet. They're both leather. But my dad gave me that number four helmet when I was just a kid, probably seven or eight years old. And it was, unfortunately, I have to say this, in pristine condition because it had been stored many years before in the antiquities. And uh, dad got it, brought it home, and uh, gave it to me. Unfortunately, I left it out in the rain. I wore it to every real and pretend fire that I went to including the city of Rockland uh, burning down at one point and watching, uh, you know, fires uh, from afar, thinking I was a firefighter. And of course, I was only seven or eight years old at the time. So wonder he didn't drive over it with the automobile, which he had done with other things. In any event, those are two artifacts that sort of are, are beginning points. Uh, as far as collecting the miniatures that I have, I can't honestly tell you which the first miniatures are. Uh, I've collected sparingly. If you want to uh, actually see some of the some of the things that are uh, better in the collection, this truck here was given by the Governor General of Canada to the Chief Fire Marshal of the Canadian Forces. So Governor General Raina Titian gave that to a man named Singleton, Harold Singleton, who was the Chief Fire Marshal. If you look in here, you'll also see some photographs, sorry, some images of uh, various cities and towns. These here that say Chicago, obviously, are from Chicago, but you'll notice Chicago has a black and red paint scheme. If you look over here to the right, you'll see a lot of those have a yellow, uh, white, and red, and those are all from New York City. And I've been lucky enough to acquire those some of those up here on the second shelf are from Italy. I had the good luck to live there for seven months and be involved with their fire service a little bit. And then some of those are actually uh, European or British style trucks. This crowd of things over here have some old things and some new things. This is basically what's called a watchman's rattle. It was sort of like an early warning system for people that there's a fire going on or to get people out of the way as the steamers were coming or the hose wagons oftentimes being dragged. This device here is actually a system for choosing firefighters. So if you wanted to get in, the members would vote by taking a white ball if they wanted you. And if they didn't want you, they'd put in a black ball. And you'd either have one black ball would be enough or two black balls. But they would go around and they would vote and be closed. And then in the end, you'd look in the back side of the thing and you'd say, oh, yeah, there's white balls. Oh, yeah, wait a minute. Is there anything else in here? Yeah, there's a black ball. Uh oh, the guy's out. And I actually joined the fire department like that in that manner uh, way back in the 80s. And uh, don't regret it for a minute. This is sort of a stylized image of a steam pumper and a three-horse hitch going to a fire. 
Now, it wasn't uncommon in these days, probably up until about 1914, 1915, for fire departments to use primarily horse-drawn vehicles like this. In earlier days, actually what was used uh, were person-hauled reels or wagons. And so basically you'd have a core of, of, in those days, men that would pull the things. And Dalmatians or other dogs would run ahead trying to scare people or things out of the way. And the firefighters would be just running as fast as they could to get this to a fire. This is in the days when they used what were called hand tubs. So you had a, a pumping device that was basically a, a basically just a, a vacuum pump. And they would be pumping with these things, putting water on the fire. It wasn't uh, too long, however, that people realized the steam engine, which is being developed in the UK to a large degree at that point to power steam trains, could be used also as the motive power for pumps. So then a steamer like this was created. This part here would be the boiler. The boiler would produce a great deal of steam. The steam would be shot down in here into the steam chest and eventually it would move two pistons or more if the thing was bigger. And those pistons would actually produce the motive power for a pump. These were amazing days. The horses were unbelievably intelligent the firefighters were rough as bags and tough as nails. And the steam engines did a really fine job moving water, but they were cumbersome. Sometimes they were quirky and under certain circumstances they would explode, although thank God not often. And eventually when people that had to pay for the horses realized the cost of the horses was expensive. And always trying to cut back on the cost of things at a municipal level it was decided to try the newfangled gasoline-powered engine. So the horses were kind of pushed out of the way, not all at once, but a little bit. And the fire departments began to use gasoline power to move the steamer. So if you look at this, you'll see that the very beginning of this, the front of this, is a gasoline engine. And this device here is called a Christie front-wheel drive and they just replaced the horses with this tractor and pulled the old steam engines. Well, they were cumbersome, awkward, hard to maneuver, but they were cheaper than the horses. The horses were very expensive. So eventually, and here's another example of one right here. This is a Franklin model of the same idea. And that type of a fire pumper was used for a number of years but not very long in the thick of things, they uh, realized quite quickly that they could transfer the power from the gasoline engine into a pump and therefore not have to have a steam boiler working behind the scenes. And there was about a 10, 15, 20 year period where the conversion from steam and horse-drawn vehicles to gasoline powered and then eventually diesel powered vehicles was in effect. Once the horses went away and the steam pumpers went away, we've just seen a continuous deliberation and development of the fire engine as we know it today. And even though you can look at a contemporary fire engine and see a beautiful piece of work, using computers to control the flow of water, using a lot of hydraulics, using a, a number of contemporary mechanical and electronic devices to make it possible to do the work. Basically, the fire pump of the type that's downstairs, the 1933 ALF, is doing the same work that a contemporary pumper does today, and that's simply moving water to get the water onto the fire as quickly as possible. From my point of view, the fire truck should always be red. You'll hear people say that they should be lime green, that they should be white, they should be blue, purple, black, and I've got examples of all of those, but a fire truck should be red. Here's why. In the early days, the fire truck had four wheels, and a crew of eight. Now four and eight is 12. 12 inches is a ruler. Now a ruler was the Queen Mary. 
and the Queen Mary was a ship. And the ship sailed in the sea. Now in the sea, there were fish. And the fish, of course, had fins. Now the fins fought the Russians. And the Russians are always red. And the fire engines are always Russian. Therefore, they have to be red. And it's red. I'd like to once again give a huge thank you to Dr. Will Brooks for volunteering his time to share his collection with us. I have to say, it was an absolute pleasure to get to know and interview Will about his collection and his exploits that will be remembered throughout Canadian history. It's just, you know, it, it was a really amazing experience. And honestly, to all of you, I recommend that if ever you're down in Lunenburg and his museum is open, you should definitely stop by and check out Will. Links are in the description. Unfortunately, though, this does wrap things up for this video. However, on the topic of history and Lunenburg, our next interview with the experts episode coming out on Friday will feature a two-time winner of the Atlantic Historical Book Award for Historical Writing, and this person is widely known as the author of The August Gales and of his new upcoming book, As British as the King. Stay tuned for our interview with Gerald Hollowell coming out next Friday at 12 p.m. Take care and have a nice day.